This episode of Living the Front Seat Life podcast is sponsored by BIPOC Peak, breaking the stigma and silence and prioritizing needs. They're hosting the Mental Health and Communities of Color Conference on July 13th, 14th, and 16th in Rochester, Buffalo, and Syracuse, New York. Register for this incredible conference today at BIPOCParentVoice.org. JazzCast Pros. I tell my clinical colleagues that we have group therapy every Sunday. It's called church. <laughs> that all the curative factors that are needed, we find in church. However, I also need and recommend paid professionals who are well-versed in mental health. It's not either or, it's both fan. We also wanted to say to interfaith clergy to help normalize trauma in terms of Given what you've experienced, of course you're traumatized. So let's not rush to pathologize you. Let's find out and let's talk about what happened to you. As a psychoanalyst, I want to find out why is it that you behave like that? And let's delve into your past, into your present functioning. Let's find patterns, if you will. Let's interpret dreams. Let's look at what they would call resistances and find out what's going on that causes us in a conflict that pushes you to behave in a certain way that doesn't match the values that you say you live by. When a gift you bring to your congregation to affirm the value of mental health and to and encourage folks to get help. And I said, and there are places in the Bible where clearly these were mental health issues and not to avoid those issues, or not to over-spiritualize them, but to call them for what they are. Welcome to Living the Front Seat Life Podcast. It is your host, Coach Kelly Marie, recording from Buffalo, New York. And I am excited to be here with you again. Please like, subscribe, and share this podcast. If you're getting something out of it, I know that someone else will too. And, uh, you know, don't keep all this goodness to yourself. So send it to a friend, send it to a family member, post it up on your timeline, let people know that they should be living and listening to Living the Front Seat Life podcast. So we have been in conversation. Um, Our uh, last two shows and this show um, have all been sponsored by BIPOC Peak, Breaking the Stigma, Breaking the Silence, and it is going to be an incredible time in Rochester, Buffalo, and in Syracuse as we dive into mental health for communities of color. There is someone that is going to be speaking at all three events. That person is our guest today, the Reverend Dr. Willard Ashley Sr. Dr. Ashley is a New Jersey and nationally certified psychoanalyst, certified group psychotherapist, and clinical fellow in the Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. He's the pastor of Abundant Joy Community Church in New Jersey and the author of several books, including New Rules for Radicals, TNT for Faith-Based Leaders. I am so very honored to have Dr. Ashley with us today, and I hope you enjoy our conversation, Reverend Dr. Ashley. Well, thank you. Thank you again for your kind invitation. And as you can imagine, my heart goes out to the people in Buffalo. I cannot begin to imagine the heartbreak and the horror that you've experienced. And being a person of faith, know that I'm praying with you and praying for you. I am a marriage and family therapist. I am also a psychoanalyst, group certified group therapist, and I've been a pastor for 40 years now. And I've just recently retired um, as a professor at the oldest Protestant seminary in America, New Brunswick Theological Seminary, where I was the first black academic dean in their 230 plus year history. And so Sometimes people say, well, you look like me, so we, we, we understand each other culturally. And say, actually, we don't because you're from the Caribbean and I'm from the South, or I'm from the Midwest and you're from a different geography. And so, mm-hmm. yes, we look the same, but culturally, and I'm very, I'm, I am crystal clear, Western New York 
is not New York City. And I think it's important to know, I'm looking forward to the conference, but I wanna be very, very clear. I am not coming in as the resident expert that knows more about your region than you do. I think that that's arrogant and that's not who I am. I'm coming in saying that I've had some experiences around trauma since 1992 when a group of pastors in Miami, Florida after Hurricane Andrew said, come down and help us. And that was my first experience as, as, as a quote unquote trauma consultant. And I said, I have no idea what to do. And they said, you're a pastor, you're a psychoanalyst, you're a professor, the flight is three hours, figure it out. <laughs> 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 and by the time I got down there, I, I, through prayer and the things that I did know, I figured it out. And I've always tried to approach these situations that you don't know what you do not know until you get there. And so consultant 101 is you go in dumb because in reality you are. You may know a lot about your particular subject, but you do not know the nuances of that particular geographic location. You don't know all the nuances about that particular culture. And, and so one of the things that I've always tried to use as my kind of my rubric is that when you go someplace, you have to first learn the language. And every geography has its own unique language. They may all speak English or a particular dialect or something, but they're just certain terms and certain experiences that are part of the language you need to learn. Then the second thing is to learn the culture that too many times people want to do interventions and don't have any appreciation for the culture of that particular geography for that particular people. And it's important to understand culture and Sometimes because someone looks like you, you make an assumption that you know and understand their culture when you do not. And I say to people that want to insist, but no, we're both black. Okay, I'm going to give you an egg. You're not both going to cook some eggs, okay? I guarantee you it's the same egg or the same carton. Mine will taste different than yours. Mm -hmm. You're going to put your Haitian seasoning on it. Or, or, or your Dominican Republic seasoning, on, I'm going to put my Georgia seasoning. It's the same egg, but it's going to taste different because our cultures taught us differently how to season an egg. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. And Western New York will love you for making the differentiation between New York City and Buffalo and Western New York, just straight out of the gate, because most people don't do that. You know, New York... And New York means all of New York when they really mean the city mm -hmm. and lump us all together. And it is a different environment. Even, you know, Buffalo to Rochester to Syracuse, Absolutely. very different environment. Um, my producer is uh, has lived in Buffalo and lives in Rochester and it's night and day for her. You know, just the difference in how segregation in Buffalo, mm -hmm. how strong it is, mm -hmm. where an hour away, she doesn't run into the same issues. Just an hour away down the interstate, right? So I hear you and appreciate your your perspective because it, it is very true. It is very true, even within the city, whether it's East Buffalo or West Buffalo, North or South, it, you, someone from, you know, around the way is, is going to tell you they're not going over to the Fruit Belt and mm -hmm. there's only a street that crosses between the two communities, you know, so it's very much different culture within cultures, within culture. So I, I thoroughly appreciate your perspective and thank you for um, taking the time to, to go into understanding how, how people work. We were re-traumatized in New York City following 9-11 because of this culture piece. Because as soon as we had the Twin Towers go down, we had people from Oklahoma City knocking on the door, elected officials saying, hey, I'm an expert in trauma. And so they got contracts. And the mental health community spent a significant amount of time saying, we're sorry you signed that contract, but they're trying to bring Oklahoma City to New York City. And that's not going to work. Not going to work. Our theories are different around mental health. We have, they don't have a subway system. We do. We don't mm -hmm. have the United Nations. They don't right. have Broadway. We do. 
and we have Columbia University. So you're going to have these folks come up and tell the folks at Columbia University how to do mental health. Lots of luck on that one. So I am a minister in a non-denominational Christian uh, church called Impacting Love Global Ministries here in Buffalo. And my ministry is mental health. Yeah, I my pastor is Garney Davis Jr. He actually is a trauma chaplain of ECMC. He's the pastoral care director. So Erie County Medical Center is the trauma hospital here in Buffalo. Okay. And so he has been on the scene. He was one of the first folks on the scene at the massacre at Tops. And he really pushed me because he was a part of my recovery process. Um, I have a mental health diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, just background in uh, anxiety and depression. And so in 2013, I attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. And so they ended up transferring me to a private hospital. And that's where I was in recovery, just trying to learn how to live. But I didn't want to live. I was still, I wasn't suicidal, but I didn't want to live. I'm like, God, this is before the ministry. Before I close my eyes, I, I pray that you kept me with you keeping me with you in heaven and not allowing me to go to hell, not keep me here on earth. But since this is your decision and it is your will that I remain here, you have to show me how to live again because I don't want to. Uh, I came across Matthew 5, uh, 16, let your light so shine before men that they would see your good works, which honors your father, which is in heaven. Mm -hmm. And that was my answer to show me how to live again. All I had to do was be the light. I didn't have to worry about what to do. I didn't have to worry about being a mom or being a wife at the time or how to do those things, how to breathe, how do I function? Kelly, just be the light. So that became the verse that I lived by for many, many years, just trying to learn how to live again. And that's where this podcast came about and the ministry came about. And so he um, really pushes me to, to do it, what I'm supposed to do. So I was just thoroughly excited when I read your bio. I was like, Reverend Dr. <laughs> Ashley. All right now. So you feel free. You, you talk away. You have full license to just let the people know. Whatever it is, God has put place on your heart to just let folks know around mental health, um, around the work that you do. I, I designed what was called the Care for the Caregivers Interfaith Program. It was a ministry of the Council of Churches of the city of New York. And we were were given a grant through the American Red Cross and United Way of New York City to try to bring healing to the interfaith community with the thought that if we could heal and support the interfaith clergy, they in turn could go back to their congregations and offer support and healing to their congregations. And so it was a three prong program. The first prong was just helping clergy to appreciate the signs of trauma, to be kind of a triage center, if you will. We were saying that you see your congregants on the weekend, be it now in our case, given COVID, be it on Zoom or be it in person, you see them on a regular basis. And so you hopefully are in tune to know their ups and downs, if they look like something needs, they need help and you can offer an intervention. When they ask you to be mental health providers, we're asking you to identify those persons who need help and to be able to flag them and to be the bridge to say that part of being in a community is different people have different parts and they play different roles. And so we're gonna ask those who are proficient and effective at mental health to come in and help you through this period. We also wanted to say to interfaith clergy to help them to help normalize trauma in terms of given what you've experienced, of course you're traumatized. It's a normal response or a common response to what you, to the violence you just experienced. So let's not rush to pathologize you. Let's find out and let's talk about what happened to you. There's there's a saying that predates Oprah's book. So I'm just putting it out there that mental health providers, particularly black mental health providers would say, there's nothing wrong with you. What's happened to you is wrong. Let's talk about it. And for people of the African diaspora, That is huge because 
we get pathologized and demonized and stigmatized left and right. So for someone to say that has terminal de- terminal degrees in mental health, there's nothing wrong with you. Wow, really? What happened to you? The, four, the 400 years? Not just the 400 years, but Karen and Ken just this morning, they got on your last nerve. <laughs> right, right. So it's learn the language, understand the culture, then collaborate on meeting the needs. That's my rubric. Learn the language, understand the culture, and collaborate on meeting the needs. Too often I find that professionals write a prescription for the wrong ailment because they didn't take time to listen to the patient and ask the patient the right questions. Yes. And that, you know, 45 to 50 minute of whatever someone has been able to tell you, and I am not a mental health professional, I am a peer. Is that enough time, you know, to really get deep down into what a person has experienced in that that initial session to be able to say, aha, Eureka, this is this is the thing that is wrong with you. And that's often what folks are afraid of. No. And even if we can figure out in the first session or two what some of the inner conflicts are in your life, guess what? It may take you five or six or 12 sessions to own that that's part of the struggle in your life because we put up our defense mechanisms. We go into the denial as a defense mechanism and say, no, that's not me. That's not me. That's not me. You know, it's proverbial. Mm-hmm. He or she's going to get better. Okay. All right. I mean, th- how that works out for you. And, and so even though even though the mental prof- professional may, may kind of figure out or have a pretty good idea what's going on early on, we have to then help you to, so that you can own it, so that you can see what we see and say, wow, you, you're right. Now, have, now seeing this, what do I do? I, I do want to change. I can't force you to change. I need you to say, nope, I see this. Given my goals and values, this kind of behavior is not going to get me to where I want to be. So now help me to change I want to change and then we can begin to have do that work. So there are many types of therapies and many ways of healing but can you talk to us about what psychotherapy is what psycho um, analysis is your your specific approach mm-hmm. and what that means and kind of break that down for people because we most folks just hear therapy right and it's all all lumped in, into one mm-hmm. pot could you break it down a little bit for us? Sure. And so there are multitude, multitudinous modalities or multitudinous ways to go about psychotherapy. I won't list them all. I'll just do some generalities. It's talk. It's talk therapy. It's being able to sit down with, quote unquote, a trained professional that can hear things that maybe someone else can't hear, that they can, I use this illustration. If, if a physician looks at you and I look at you, you're the same person, but our notes will look totally different because our eyes were trained to find different things in an individual. And so a therapist is a person whose eyes and heart and spirit have been trained to look deep inside of you through the lens of your emotions, your psyche, and hopefully your spirituality. And so depending on the way that we do therapy, some people go about it and the insurance companies love it, that we can solve all your problems in three or five sessions and you're good. What happens is what they call cognitive behavior therapy. In other words, we change your way of thinking and in changing your way of thinking, we actually give you, I guess, a prescription, if you will. Do this, do this, do this, and do this. And your behavior has changed. And so your family, your culture, wow, change behavior. You used to be angry and curse people out. Now you don't curse people out. Wonderful. Now you're not so angry. That's great. And that, that, is, that works for some people. As a psychoanalyst, yes, I know how to do that kind of work. But why, did, why do you behave like that? Because I can teach you the technique and you'll do the technique. But one day it's going to fail you because you don't know why, what precipitated this behavior. So I want to find out why is it that you behave like that? And let's 
delve into your past, into your present functioning. Let's find patterns, if you will. Let's interpret dreams. Let's look at what they would call resistances and find out what's going on that causes us in a conflict that pushes you to behave in a certain way that doesn't match the values that you say you live by. And so if someone were looking for that type of therapeutic relationship, what questions should they ask? Are you a psychoanalyst? Exactly. They should ask, well, if you're looking for a therapist, you should always try to interview, be it on the phone or in person, more than more than one uh, clinician. So you have a, 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 some kind of comparator. And to be comfortable saying, I, I'm just, I'm trying to find someone, I'm feeling my way around, I'm going to meet with you, I might meet with two other people before I make my decision. And so you want to ask them about their training. You want to see if they have any license or certificates. Tell me please what those are. And you want to, basically what people are asking when they meet us are two questions. It may take a lot of questions to get there. In the day, if you boil it down, they're saying, are you competent and can you connect with me? Which in one sentence is saying, can you help me? And so you might have different questions to get to that, but you're saying big umbrella, can you help me? Meaning, are you competent? Are you educated, experienced in what I'm going through? You may have all all these other kind of books and accolades, but can you help me with what I'm doing? Is your competence level with this? And then secondarily, can we connect? I'm glad I'm glad you're on television. I'm glad you wrote books and all of that kind of you're doing lectures. That's wonderful. But can you relate to me? Everybody's Google. So Google them, look them up, put their name in there and see, see what populates. And so they tell you that they can, they can handle your trauma. But when you look them up on Google, nothing suggests in their bio that they've ever done this kind of work. So I want to be curious, how can you say you can help me? And I've looked you up and nothing suggests that you have any expertise in this. Talk to me, right? Yes, 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 yes. I love it. Let's switch gears just a little bit and talk a little bit about faith and faith and mental health. I speak with a lot of people that um, have been told just pray your way through. So they're afraid to speak to a therapist to, to even consider a therapeutic relationship because they believe that need or talking to someone else is an affront to their faith that they don't love in this case, Jesus and Christian, they don't love Jesus enough. And because of that, your faith is lacking. Can you just speak to that piece for a moment? Not because I'm a therapist, but because I've seen the value of it. Absolutely, I love the Lord. I love church. Anyone who try to take that away from me, I tell you that's not happening. I need church on Sunday. I tell my clinical colleagues that we have group therapy every Sunday. It's called church. <laughs> that all the curative factors that are needed we find in church. However, however, I also need and recommend that we need paid professionals who are well-versed in mental health. It's not either or, it's both and. I, I can jump over or jump over pews and do somersaults over pews and say I'm at Holy Ghost headquarters on Sunday, but I need the one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone that can help me sort out within my faith, within, within my struggles, things that are a mirror so I can see what Willard needs to work on. And that happens through the lens of having these conversations, these sometimes difficult conversations. I, I can go to church and I can kind of ignore what the pastor said and say, oh, he's not talking to me. She's not talking to me. I'm in the room with the therapist one on one. They say, no, actually, we are talking to you. And this is this is the mirror of your behavior. And here's how this kind of behavior impacts you in relationship with other people and to have that kind of a conversation and to recognize that we go through things. It's part of life. It's part of the curriculum called life. And we need someone that people that will be able to help us to sort through those challenges and to make a difference for us. So one of my colleagues said that we, we, we're, the, we're the tugboat that helps launch the big ships out into the ocean and to look at it that way and that we're behind the scenes helping you to be the person that you say that you want to be. 
I love it. And what about a word to faith leaders? How have you been able to break through that belief that faith leaders should be, one, taking on mental health conditions, concerns, and challenges, and two, that they themselves may need to seek some mental health support? It's really easier than people make it out to be. And, and I'll, I, this is why I say it. There is a term that I have found over the 40 year period. I don't care if you're black, white, Asian, Latinx, Southern, Caribbean, African. If you are a congregational leader of any faith, all I have to say to you is tell me about your worst congregational meeting on well, the Christian context church meeting. I've yet to see somebody say, oh, that was always a pleasant experience. Never had a fight in those. <laughs> <laughs> Every person I know that's a congregational leader so can, can remember the church meeting from hell like it just happened yesterday. And I say, so when that, when that meeting happened and after you spoke to God about it, how did you process what's happened? What did you do with that toxic negative energy? How did you address it? And most of the time I say, well, I didn't have anybody. I didn't have anybody I could trust in a safe space. To even have a kind of conversation to say, ouch. So I start with that. I say, well, if you're having a hard time finding safe spaces for conversations that matter but are difficult, how might that also be the case for your congregants? And what a gift, what a gift you bring to your congregation to affirm the value of mental health and to and encourage folks to get help. And I said, and there are places in the Bible where clearly these were mental health issues and not to avoid those issues or not to over-spiritualize them, but to call them for what they are. Elijah just, just had a victory over the false prophets and he's hiding out in a cave. The man was depressed. <laughs> mm -hmm. And God said, dude, like, why are you hanging out in the cave? Like, whoa. I'm the only one doing this kind of work. Nobody else is doing this but me, and I'm hiding out because they're trying to get rid of me. And, you know, and God said, get, get a grip. You're not the only one doing this. Open your eyes and stop the pity party. <laughs> <laughs> get with the program. I'm glad you're doing this, but you're not alone. Right, right. And how often do we hear someone, either the voice of God or someone else saying, hey, you are not alone. There are other folks doing this work. I mean, Jesus saying to the person at the pool, this is not a trick question. Do you want to get well? Right. Because <laughs> you've been doing this for a long time, okay? So you're trying to right. tell me in 38 years, nobody could help you in the pool and you couldn't help yourself, all right? Uh, yeah, okay. So let, let's cut to the chase. You know, are you having what they say secondary gain because you get some benefit of being, being, being the invalid by the pool? Yes. Right? So do you want to get well? So I think pastors can find within scripture those places where clearly somebody was having a mental health challenge and how and how it was addressed in your sacred literature is one thing. And again, I, I say to my congregation, I've said this for as so long as I've been a pastor, as long as I've been in ordained ministry, hey, I know I'm certifiable. <laughs> Dr. Ashley, thank you so much for joining me today. Let's continue this conversation next week. We are going to dive a little into talking to family about mental health and what kind of questions to ask your therapist when you are looking for someone to sit down with. July is National Mental Health Awareness Month. We are focusing here in Buffalo on trauma and the trauma response. And so um, Sarah Taylor, the founder of Partners in Community Development and the BIPOC Peak Project has brought together an incredible group of speakers. I am one, I will be speaking in Rochester on July 13th. And there will also be a symposium being held in Buffalo on July 14th and in Syracuse on July 16th. Register for this incredible conference today at BIPOCParentVoice.org.